Okay, welcome again, everybody. We will uh, get started. So a uh, very warm welcome to today's webinar, the Blueprint for Post-Corona Workforce Management. As you uh, may be able to figure it out, I'm not the German one on the, on the uh, webinar, so I'll, I'll save all the, all the anecdotes for uh, Max and, and Sarah. My name is Sammy Walton. I am the Director of Sales Engineering at Quinix. I'll be your, your host today and I'll, I'll make you a short introduction to the, uh, to the speakers that we have. I'd love to retain the, the center of attention, but uh, we have some amazing uh, speakers joining us from WidgetBrain, uh, Deloitte, and of course, uh, Quinix. Uh, and these speakers will give you a great understanding of, of how you can really blueprint your uh, post-corona workforce management. Uh, Martin, Sarah, and uh, Max are all experts in their field, and they'll take you through different aspects of uh, how to make your personnel resource planning fit for the requirements uh, for your business after the uh, crisis. You might be thinking, uh, what if you have a question? Well, we love questions. Uh, throughout the webinar, you'll be able to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A box as demonstrated in, in this slide. Uh, you'll be able to easily submit a question. Don't be shy. Uh, the only thing I ask is when you do submit a question, can you please ensure that you, if it is for one specific speaker, can you please address it to that uh, particular speaker? So the three speakers we have today, uh, Max, the country manager for uh, Quinix in, in Germany, and Martin, the co-founder of uh, WidgetBrain uh, and CRO of WidgetBrain, uh, who are a market leader in, in algorithm-based uh, workforce uh, management. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Nering. Uh, she is the senior manager at Deloitte Consulting, uh, who really helps companies prepare their transition for the future of workforce planning. So. I'll uh, leave you with uh, Sarah for now. So it works better when I unmute. Um, so thanks, Sammy. Um, hi, my name's Sarah Nering from Deloitte Consulting in Germany. And um, I've been implementing workforce management tools and payroll solutions for close to 30 years now. And um, working for Deloitte, what, we're really well known for our trends and um, this is to help our customers to understand what's coming up to be prepared for what's coming up so that they can um, adapt rapidly um, it's because what we're seeing is that it's the companies that can adapt or what we call super responsive companies are the ones that are doing well now during the COVID-19 crisis and they're the ones that are going to do well afterwards is um, some good examples are like restaurants that were um, their model was only in-house dining that have changed their models to do takeaway or deliveries or shops where you could only go into the shop to buy things have now moved to online so things are changing really rapidly um, let's go on to the next slide and um, so what are the trends we're seeing now with the future of work? We're seeing that these companies are changing models are becoming quote unleashed and collect connected on a digital platform and able to work anywhere, anytime like we're doing today. But what does that mean for workforce management? I mean, um, with um, working anytime and anywhere, this really needs to be planned well, as well as well managed. And from what I've experienced with the companies that I've seen, the tools that they currently have in place, and a lot of them are just using Excel lists to, um, to plan their workforces. These tools aren't capable of managing the workforce trends of the future. They're not flexible enough. They're not efficient. It's really hard to measure your efficiency. And um, with these tools, there's no interaction with the employees that's needed, desperately needed, to be able to manage this in the time frames that we're looking at. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So what are we seeing on this future of work? How are we transforming it after COVID-19? We're seeing that work is completely changing. Um, a lot more digital um, and 
we think a lot of that will remain afterwards because um, companies that before COVID-19 uh, were saying, no, 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 we can't do it this way. And now that we're forced to work digitally, we're finding that, hey, sometimes it works and it means a lot more travel, less, a lot less traveling, a lot more connectivity and a lot more ingenuity to connect with each other. And so it'll be, it'll be a challenge to see what do we keep of that and how do we change it? What, with those changes, what we're gonna see is the workforce is changing. So we're gonna need to, to help the workforce to adapt to that, to, um, to help them learn, to get the right skills and the right experience. And the workplace is changing because there you're getting a more of a blend of your physical workforce and your virtual workforce. And so there are a lot of challenges coming up and we're going to have to change the mindset on how to get the workforce planned and um, planned for the future. Let's go on to the next slide then. Let's go into a little bit more practical steps on how to accelerate this transition after COVID. So the first step of all is always the start. Where do you start? I mean, this is a huge beast that we are going to have to do. You know, the companies that we're looking at are quite large and you're not going to be able to trans transition from today to tomorrow. So the important thing with the start is to find out where does, where do you need the most flexibility, most efficiency, and that, or where can we adapt most rapidly? And that's gonna be where we get started and then roll out to the other parts of the company. And as we said, it's gonna be the super responsive companies that are going to, to um, do well in the future. Um, One of the things with the start um, is that, like I was saying, we need more flexibility and efficiency. But what we're going to need to do in this beginning after COVID-19 is to predict demand. Because all of the patterns that we've been using in the past for predicting what resources we need when is changing. Um, take a look at the, the supermarkets. You know, when we were predicting before, we always said, oh, you know, we need our workforce typically in the evenings after people are coming back from work or on Saturdays. We saw spikes shortly before holidays, like tomorrow, because everybody wants to shop and have more. But with COVID, we're seeing that the patterns are changing extremely rapidly. You know, it's people going out shopping early in the mornings after all the, the um, stocks have been um, replenished or, um, or um, another example is, uh, I don't know, kind of lost my thread there. Um, like I said, the shops being um, closed then some days and Going back um, now, after COVID, it's, it's not gonna be like a, a light switch. We're not gonna go from one day to the next day and everything is back to normal, but we're gonna see a lot of phasing into that normal, normalcy. And what does that mean? We're gonna need to have predictive analytics to be able to help us get, um, to, to understand what's coming for us. And, we're also going to be needing to be more flexible with the way we're going to be planning those and we're going to need those tools. So that's going to be our starting point. But then we need to understand what are the capabilities that we're going to need to be able to do that transition? You know, what tools do we have? Um, how can we manage the transition from old tools that aren't supporting our, our needs and requirements to transitioning to the newer tools that can interact with our employees quickly. That can give us the flexibility that we need in the workforce. And we're gonna to need to do some exploring. What are the experiences, the experiences of the employees? You know, we need to enable, we need to empower the employees so that they can help choose when they're working um, to add also to their flexibility. Um, what we saw during the COVID was 
there's a lot of different situations. We've got single parents out there that couldn't work because of the kindergartens being closed. We've got, you know, families at home that they need to readjust the way they're working. And if we're exploring ways to empower them and also keep them engaged during this time, and this will also then add to employee satisfaction. And we always know that adding to employee satisfaction, in the end, adds to the customer satisfaction long-term, which brings in a lot more revenue. And then we need to apply what we've learned with practices and places to, um, to the technology to improve that. And last but not least, we need to be able to measure that. Um, we need to be able to measure how efficiently are we planning our workforce? Are we getting the right people in at the right time, which then lowers the cost um, because we're being more efficient, but yet more satisfaction because they're being there at the right time and the right place. And that's going to be the future of work. Okay, that being said, let's go on to the, um, the next slide. Um, building flexibility to, for the future. So looking at this, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to define those business module, models. What are they looking like for the future? What kind of workforce are we going to need then to support those business models? Um, and because of that, we're going to need to do a lot of upskilling and cross-training and make sure that when we're doing the planning, we've got the right people with the right skills in the right place. And this is going to be have, going to have to be digital um, so that we can add the flexibility, the quickness, the efficiency in there. We need to be nimble and responsive. And let's go to the last slide. Say, what questions should we be asking ourselves at the moment? Where, where can we apply these lessons learned for work? future workforce strategies. We need to do a mo much more dynamic forecasting um, and we need more performance indicators to say, are we being efficient the way we're planning our workforce? Um, how could a ramp up tactic look like? Because as I said, it's not gonna be normal as of day one. How do we ramp this up? How do we bring in the information from the employees? Um, how do we pull in their individual situations going forward? How do we prioritize? Because as of you know, when we start going back to normal, um, some industries are going to be going, having different um, periods on when they can start going back. Um, and also, it's going to be a stage return, but some regions in the country will be impacted differently than others. And so this is where we need to start looking at trends. We need predictive analytics and we need tools to support us to be able to prioritize and get the right people back at the right phases after this. Um, and what might employee experience include? Um, tiered communication, uh, much more flexible communication because before in the past, it's always been, okay, um, we, send, we typically um, make phone calls because they don't have work email addresses and that makes communication extremely difficult. Um, and we need to engage the employees because it's not just sending out once a month uh, a work schedule and say, this is how you're working next month, but how do we bring them in if you know the flexibility for example, in the retail, um, all of a sudden, a lot more people are coming in in the mornings. How do we get people, the employees engaged to say who can come in this morning earlier? Um, and, and we're going to need to focus on the people and the people experience moving forward. Okay, and with that being said, um, I'm going to hand over to Martin who can tell you on how to predict some of these trends that are coming up the peaks. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks uh, for this presentation. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to uh, present uh, our company. So my name is uh, Martin De Beau. I'm co-founder of Widgetbrain. I'm uh, responsible for the office here in uh, Europe. We're based in uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. 
We also have offices in uh, Australia and United States. And basically our companies, the whole day, everybody in our company is completely occupied with how to create the best schedules. So I'm gonna walk you through in the next 10 minutes, like how do we do that? And if you have any questions, please feel free out to, uh, uh, to chat uh, with us. Next sheet. So I think like most of us are at this moment in time thinking like, um, maybe personally or business-wise, like when are we gonna reopen? When are things going back to normal? And I think this is a very uh, legit uh, question, but I also think that things will change after this. Eh? And uh, COVID uh, basically emphasized and speeded up a lot of trends, which Sarah already uh, explained. And I think the new, basically the new way people are running their uh, workforce management requires AI. It requires a new way of working and a new way of thinking. Next sheet. So most of the planners are actually spending up to four hours a week making schedules. And I don't know if any one of you ever made a schedule, but it's not the most fun to do so. Like nobody ever comes to your desk and says, hey, there was a brilliant schedule, you know? Uh, you're only getting complaints. You're only getting people say like, hey, I actually wanted to get off. Hey, why do I work the entire weekend? Uh, well, uh, he or she is not. And this is like a uh, really yeah, a pain in the ass for a lot of people. And it's it's also... Um, a decision like you can have your whole organization organized that everything is perfect but at the end the planner if he or she makes a bad schedule you can waste your entire profit margins and you can really lose your most uh, uh, faithful employees as well next sheet <clears throat> so what are they doing well planners are estimating future demand and this varies per location then they need to check like, okay, if this is gonna be the demand, how many people do I then need to cope with this demand? And then they need to check who's available. So WhatsApp groups are open, they're gonna check who's available, shifts are swapped, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, while they're doing this, because this is already very complex, they also need to respect employee preferences because people wanna get off uh, at the moment it suits them. And they need to, over top of that, also need to comply with labor laws. And the current trend with labor laws is that they're only getting more complex because the thing with labor laws is that they are never made by people who are making schedules. They're always made by politicians and they don't have a clue how difficult it is to make a schedule. So they keep on inventing new rules, which make the whole process even more complex. Next sheet. So as said, we try to reduce in our company to reduce the amount of time spent on schedules from four to hours to 50 minutes while well, creating real business value, creating happy employees, and make sure your costs are down. Next sheet. So how do we do that? Well, first thing is that it needs to fit with your planning flow. And in this example, I will take a retail a little bit more throughout this presentation, but it works for every business line. We are active in a lot of different industries. First of all, depending on your legislation or depending how you work as a company, you need to publish an initial schedule. So let's take, for example, 28 days ahead, four weeks. You create a forecast, you create the shifts, and you assign staff. This can be completely automated. You don't have to do anything for that. Then, because the world changes, eh? like uh, things are dynamic. So uh, after some time, after three weeks, for example, one week ahead, you want to make sure that with the latest actuals, like the, for example, the latest sales data, the latest order data, or maybe even the weather, it's easier to forecast weather two weeks ahead than uh, four weeks ahead. You want to check like, where are we? Are we on target? Or do we need to change? Do we need to add additional shifts? Or maybe when people are saying like, I'm not able to work, keep the shifts closed so you can reduce the amount of people that are working. Or do I need to hire external people to help me out with the increased demand? So you're gonna automatically update that and you're gonna do that for every day. So for example, one day ahead, you do exactly the same. You're gonna really visualize in our tooling, like where do we stand now with the latest in weather, uh, actual sales data, and maybe even promotions. So to make sure you're not overstaffing, neither understaffing. And this is a continuous process. And most of the planners are doing this already at this moment in time. And we focus on automating this process. Next sheet. So why do we do the, why do you need technology? And why can't you just let your planners do so? Well, I think like, Creating forecasts is not new. Eh? It is already, uh, the technology already exists for a long, long time. But what is different is that at this moment in time, we are able to do it very economically with new technologies in the cloud, scalable software, data availability, because your, uh, your order systems are online, your ERP systems online, your register systems are online. 
we are now able to actually make very accurate forecasts for every individual uh, location. And we can take seasonality into account, weather, events, and promotions. And this goes automatically because the weather API is online available. There's a public event uh, API available. Promotions you can read out now from your online marketing system. This all can be done uh, automated instead of manual. And why is this important? Well, if you look to this graph, this graph gives you seasonality of traffic for one of our customers uh, at an airport. And basically you see the differences because of seasonality. You know, you see big dents, big deviations. And for a human to do this out on top of his head her, or her head, this is really difficult. So actually most of the planners are making a forecast. They're actually taking last year, day the second uh, Wednesday in May at 5% growth rate and basically copy the data. Well, in practice, you can uh, add a lot of business value if you do this with uh, AI technology. Thanks, Sheet. And then even if you made the perfect forecast, you still are then, uh, you need to make shifts to uh, level with that forecast, you know, you, and then assign people to work those shifts. And this is also really difficult because um, when you create shifts, when you're working in the middle of a company, there are also the people you work with you need to assign to those shifts. So what we see with a lot of uh, our customers is that uh, because everybody wants to be off in the weekend, you have like an, a permanent undercoverage during the weekends. They also see that like they underestimate the demand in, for example, the late afternoons compared to the mornings because it's difficult to estimate it. Normally they take it just as a normal parable while it's actually more a triangle with more uh, uh, depth at the end of the day. And the, if this is like actually a company that's doing it quite well manually, if you look at it, it's quite a good coverage, but still you can reduce so much cost and reduce lost sales if you're doing this with AI technology, because with technology, you can perfectly match this instead of uh, with manual. Next sheet. So I just want to stress that if you think at this moment in time, it's, uh, uh, it's already difficult, the near future is going to be even more unsure because we expect a lot more regulation to change. And also the, for the international companies that joined this call, uh, these regulation, well, it's, it's diverse per Bundesstaten, but also diverse per country everywhere. So regulation is only going to increase and it's only going to be more difficult to make sure you're running a compliant workforce management solution. Also demand is going to be more dynamic. Like Sarah already pointed out, we see an increase in uh, peaks and uh, 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 lower demand at uh, times we didn't expect. So AI is going to have an even more role, uh, play a bigger role into that as well. And staffing availability. At this moment in time, employees are getting scarcer and scarcer. And they actually are choosing companies to work uh, if the company offers them the moment they can work that uh, fits with the personal life. So being able to cope with dynamic staffing availability is like a must have in the near future. You really need to be able, <coughs> apologies, you really need to be able to collect the data when they are available uh, in a dynamic way. And you need good workforce management software like Queenix to do so. And when you have collected that data and you are able to cope with dynamic demand and you are able to basically uh, uh, use the regulation that's changing, you are ready for shorter planning horizons and making sure you're not over or understaffing. And this has amazing results. Next sheet. Because if you implement this well with a good workforce management system to collect the data, an architecture where you can read out the orders and demand data from the cloud in a uh, real-time manner, then you are able to create uh, compliance that is uh, an organization that's 100% compliant. You are able to meet your service requirements. If it's retail, you want to reduce the sales, or it's another service level agreement you need to adhere to. You are able to reduce 5 to 10% labor cost. And actually, when well, I always say, like, I really like humans, but I do think that uh, computers are far better at creating an equal schedule and a fair environment than humans, you know? So, and we also see that back in data. If we uh, do an, uh, uh, a questionnaire among employees that receive uh, their schedules by AI, they uh, claim it's far fairer and more equal compared to schedules that are created by humans. And maybe even if the schedule is not even uh, more fair, then still they perceive it as more fair because they think like, well, the computers just made the decision based on rules instead of sentiment. And that is a very important difference to create a uh, fair and equal uh, working environment. 
if you want to know more, please uh, give us a call or ask some questions in the chat. Uh, but at this moment in time, I really like to uh, give the word to Max, our country manager from Phoenix in uh, Germany. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, now the German accent, very strong after the American and the Dutch one. Um, ich spreche natürlich auch Deutsch, bin in Hamburg, um, but we switched back to English because we all speak, uh, have spoken English. So, um, happy to introduce you into Quinex. Um, yes, my name is Max. Next slide, please. Good, so a short wrap up because you've stayed online all the time. So what we've heard so far is the agile approach um, from Sarah because work, workforce and workplace are changing. Um, thank you also, Martin, for all the good insights for automated scheduling, forecasting with high accuracy. So last thing, and this is my turn, is how to tackle all this and how to put all this into practice. Um, next slide, please. As we all know, it's not um, a secret, we all go digital. You might be one of these penguins, the very foremost, uh, foremost there on the right-hand side or the last one. You decide yourself in which position you find yourself in terms of digitalization. Um, but this is just to remind us, next slide. And what we always um, need to um, 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 take into consideration is uh, you can see the future when you're looking back. So when you're looking back, 2010, we got um, the iPhone, um, the mobile phones were reaching mass status. In 2010, um, we uh, started to generate a lot of data. And in 2015, we had the cloud business. Um, so a lot of advantages to the cloud business, as we all know, but the one um, advantage in cloud business is also that we got all the data stored in one database. Um, so that opened up for 2020, the next step, that all these data could be generated and AI is very popular right now, algorithms. So they take us to a next step of value creation. And all this data, and that's what we are so, uh, seeing right now, is what is next will lead to the age of optimization. So we just put that in 2025. You may judge yourself uh, when that is going to happen. But since we have all these new data, we can reveal new patterns, which will open up for new services, new products, uh, new business models, but will also drive, as Martin was saying, um, efficiency and flexibility. Next slide. But today we are not uh, here about to talk about your robots and how to make them more efficient, your online shop in terms of click streams, um, shopping cart um, revenue or whatever. Neither we are talking about your supply chain. They are all well organized. Um, we are talking about, next slide, of course, your employees, uh, because uh, they are the ones who will create even bigger value for you in the future and they should be taken care of. Um, we always know and always um, remember um, the person from the next slide um, who has always taught us, next slide, dear Richard, um, who is putting not the customer first, um, as we would all think in terms of retail, no, it's your employee. Because if you take care of your employees, they will take care of your business and your customers. And if we go back to the next slide, that means that taking care of your employees actually means um, that you should have these three things um, in place. First, um, as Sarah was putting it, um, for retail employees, work-life balance is really important because their life is complex. They need a lot of flexibility, childcare and so forth, multi-jobbers. So they appreciate this even more um, when Corona is over. Modern technology, they all know that modern technology is going to make their life a lot more easier looking at banking apps, looking at Facebook, looking at Quinix, looking at um, um, Instagram and whatsoever. So they see that this is creating value for their lives and they wanna use modern technology because it makes processes easier and of course communication. And last but not least, all of these employees, also the retail employees, will need to use a lot of technology and this is why they are looking for usability because they don't wanna be trained a lot. They don't wanna go into all that hassle. They wanna use it the way they also use it on a private level as we've seen from the apps. Next slide. So let's put this into context. Um, so we have three scenarios put up for you. One, two, and three, you see. Um, the first two are a little bit negative one. So we uh, start, uh, we, we end with a positive one. So imagine this summer is going to be really hot in Europe. 
and nobody's going into the into town in order to shop um, and they are all hanging out at um, some swimming pool areas um, or in their gardens and um, so you would have to respond to your with your retail force um, to create flexible schedules or we have another lockdown with corona um, also responding and being very flexible with your workforce um, in dealing with scenario one and two but let's hit the best scenario, which is um, Christmas is coming up, Corona is over, and people have a lot of money to spend, and they want to um, go and buy and go out for your shops. So what is happening then? Next slide. We remember um, Martin, who was just presenting to us, um, that in order to meet the demand, which is coming up there on Christmas, you will need a very good and intelligent schedule. Um, so Martin is putting up, or Widget Brain is putting up the exact schedule, what you need. And for simplicity reasons, let's say you need more cashiers in order to um, deal with all the revenue you have. So what is this going to mean then for your business? Next slide. May I present John to you? So first step on your left hand side, John is on his sofa. It's the 26th of December. He has gotten a lot of presents and he is happy. He is reading his book. And um, as a second step, you see that his phone will um, um, ping and um, present to him a new uh, cashier's um, shift, which is available the next day. So since John is really happy and he has um, done all he needed uh, in terms of Christmas and he wants to work again, he applies for that shift and can be at work, step three, even the next day or the next hour, no calls involved. And this is really making his life easier because maybe he needs some extra money in order to finance his ski trip in the next days. So they're very easy to use for John and very easy to use for any retail organization. Next slide. Let's say all the customers are coming into your um, store and they are, and you're offering a bonus program for the customers. You want them to come back, make more revenue. And we want to know whether um, all the cashiers are feeling pros uh, comfortable um, while processing this bonus program. So um, first step, you see uh, John's phone um, where you actually can ask your cashiers, employees, how comfy do you actually feel with processing your bonus, our bonus program on your till? So second step, you would see that um, John's phone would display uh, the question. He puts a smiley and says, okay, that's fine. If he doesn't have much time, he can also write a text and then send over that answer. And last step, number three, as a manager in HR and marketing and training or whatever, you see the results and you see whether you have to retrain John or the Johns um, in order to process the, broad, uh, the um, uh, bonus program accordingly. So another, thing, another example where technology can actually help um, John doing his job better. Last example, next slide, please. Let's say on the left-hand side, you have Marie. Marie is a colleague of John and Marie is new and she isn't too comfortable with using, using the till and he, she always needs help from John and John is help, uh, happy to help her. So Marie's phone, you see that she can actually say thank you on a virtual, a virtual basis via badges. So first step, Marie chooses cashier hero. And second step rewards a colleague. In this um, case, it's John. So she just hits these two buttons. And then you see John's phone. He gets a cashier hero badge. Um, so you can all, even put it like this, just, just very plain. But you can also link that to um, any, sense, any, any means of remuneration in your HR and in order to pay recognition to John. So these were three examples. Next steps. Uh, next slide, sorry, <laughs> always next, 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 um, where we can actually um, tie in the balance of work life, modern technology and usability, what, what all these people are actually going to look for. Next slide. So we are very proud to serve and uh, here I'm ending my speech almost. Um, you remember the penguins, they were all on that um, uh, path towards digitalization. Uh, we are very proud to serve all these customers here you're seeing who are on that path already and who we are supporting in that very easy um, way using the technology being tied in into um, widgets brains forecasting or being tied in um, into the process Deloitte is delivering. Um, and this leads me to the end of my speech and next slide. 
Thank you, Max, Sarah, and, and Martin. There's some uh, really great themes that we've, we've heard there. I um, especially uh, liked some of what we heard from uh, Sarah, uh, talking about how the, the changes that we are seeing uh, may not be related just to, to the COVID crisis, but how it's uh, fast-tracking new trends, and, and new trends may be emerging on the back of this. Uh, how you know workforce and workplaces are changing. And I think businesses really need to do all they can uh, to prepare. Uh, that could be looking into upskilling their, their, their workforce, uh, digitization if they're not already on that path yet, and of course changing the way that they forecast, which then linked directly into uh, what Martin was talking about there, about how AI can really play its part in these changes optimizing and automating the decisions that the businesses need to make whilst retaining that compliance element as well that is so important. And of course, saving huge amounts of time. Uh, and the, the, the really big takeaway there, I think, is, is creating that perfect harmony with the forecasting and the scheduling aspect. And then, of course, uh, Max uh, ended us there with a quick look at a few different scenarios that could occur post-corona. Uh, but really putting an emphasis on the employee by giving them the tools to uh, keep, keep them in communication with the business, the type of tools that they really want to use, uh, those digital tools that they're so used to using uh, day to day, and really helping them enjoy work. So I think three really great uh, examples of uh, the, the times that we find ourselves in. And with that, we'd like to open it up to some uh, Q&A, some questions. Uh, so if, if you haven't yet fired in your, your question, please take the time to do so. Remember, just address it to a particular uh, speaker if, if it is addressed to uh, one of the, the three that we've heard from. But uh, I've got a couple of questions already that I'd like to uh, fire out to our panelists here. So Sarah, if I, if I may start with you, uh, one of the questions we see here is, how can we build flexibility in the workforce? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Um, building flexibility in the workforce, and typically we're seeing a lot of companies are using flexible working times, and that's great. Um, that gives us the flexibility that we're all not always having to apply for overtime, especially here in Germany, going to works councils, but we need to empower the employees to be able to, to short term say, okay, a shift is coming up tomorrow or we need to add extra hours, who's available to stay longer. Empower the employees so that once those things come up short term, that they can decide and say, yes, I can fit this in, yes, I'd like to take this. But that being said, you also need the systems checking to make sure that there are no violations that you know, you're not working over your 10 hours, that you've got your 11 hours here in Germany between shifts. And um, with an Excel sheet or some of the other tools, they haven't been able to deal with that. But with the tools like Quinix, the system is checking right away. If something's coming up, we need more top people. Um, their hours aren't taking them over limits. And then the system can prioritize and say, here's your flexible workforce, here's who you can reach out to, enable the employees to, to choose those. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. well, whilst I've got your attention, there is a, a, another one here for you as well. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, that you see when implementing digital tools to support this uh, future of work that we're talking about. Yeah, typically when I go into a lot of companies and, you know, we're trying to analyze what their processes when it comes to, to workforce management, the time management. And most of the time they look at their old system and say, this is our process. And we're saying, no, that's your legacy system. That is not your process. And, and a lot of times they're saying, well, this is how we've always done it. This is the way we have to do it instead of looking towards the future and say, how do you want it to be? You know, what are the challenges that your company's coming up with? Um, and a lot of times they're under underestimating their employees. Oh, we can't have our employees do that. You know, um, I remember a long time ago, it's like, oh, we can't have our employees requesting um, vacation on an app. I'm going, well, they're, 
they're using their smartphones uh, for many other things. It's the logical next step. Um, and so empower the employees. It gives them a lot more satisfaction. And, um, and make sure you look at things the way it should be in the future and not how it was in the past. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much for those answers. Um, I'd like to, to ask a few questions to Martin now. Uh, Martin, one of the questions that has is, is come through is, how do you measure success when you're implementing a, a prediction or forecasting algorithm? Uh, when you are attempting to forecast and predict that demand. What are the, some of the challenges that you see with that? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Lucas. So thanks for asking that. And um, what we currently are doing is that the, uh, you can focus a lot on just increasing demand forecasting, which is important, of course, but actually the, 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 the value that you create, so actually the success is if you can uh, uh, increase the, the 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 matching of demand and supply and I think like this is in the, the way if you really want to increase the, the performance of a business but sometimes customers ask us like well we actually we have an uh, employee retention problem so it's not reducing cost it's making sure that people want to stay within our company to work so actually the challenge then is like how can we create uh, schedules that are very employee friendly instead of reducing cost. And the funny thing is that we are actually running uh, three different scenarios. One is making sure you're uh, perfectly matching demand. So uh, your company is performing really well for the customers. The second thing is like, how can we reduce cost as maximum as possible? That means that, for example, in the example of a retail chain, that you're gonna have queues or may, you might lose sales. Or the third one is like, how can I increase uh, employee happiness? So basically, what is the cost? to allow all my employees to take the leave they want, which also means that sometimes you're gonna have days which are gonna be uh, understaffed because everybody, uh, nobody wants to work on Friday afternoon, for example, you know, that can be a thing. A lot of these challenges actually can be solved um, if you are able to better uh, plan further ahead. So that's more like capacity management. So if you are able to build a pool of employees with contracts that are uh, matching your longitudinal demand, then you also have less of conflict uh, for workers that want to work on a specific time slot that's more favorable than other time slots. So how to measure success? These are the challenges. And, uh, I think I can talk for 20 more minutes. I won't do that, but it's a very good question. And it really depends on the strategic goals you want to achieve. I think that's the, the, the one. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And I think you touched on some really good points there. And, and whilst we talk, I guess, in that question specifically about, you know, predicting the demand, if we move on to that, that second step of the auto creation of the actual schedules, um, what if businesses have very specific workflows, which they would deem, you know, hard to, to automate? Um, do you have any commentary around that? Yeah, so I think like um, that's for us as a company actually the uh, the most interesting because there we can add the most value because the more complex your workflow gets, the more exceptions you have and the more complex it gets to make a planning at all. And that also means that if you look to most organizations, the planners, um, uh, they have actually uh, a lot of planners that will go get their pension pretty soon, you know, so a lot of knowledge is lost to uh, to this organization if they would retire. So it's for this organization essential to move to automated scheduling because it's the only way to keep that knowledge in your organization at this moment in time. And I think like we as a company really focus on creating a lot of depth within the, the, the planning flow to being able to cope with a lot of different data sources, a lot of exception, uh, exceptions, labor standards that defer per location, uh, per demand driver, and so on, and so on. And sometimes, obviously, these implementation cycles take more time because yeah, you need to test it and you need to work with them. But in the end, it is possible. And at the same time, uh, I do also think that organizations need to think like, why do we have such a complex flow? Eh? Because sometimes I, I come in organizations and they have very complex flow, but it's also different from location A and location B. So 
then we ask the management, so how do you want to execute? Do you want us to build a model that for the same organization is different for location A and B? Or do, you, uh, do we need to go back to the drawing board and design an, an, an organization approach that's more simple and then actually fits with a digital enterprise instead of making exceptions for every customer, keeping everybody happy, et cetera? Because that doesn't scale, you know? Sometimes you need to make choices. But this is maybe also something more that you need to hire Sarah. And then when you came to the conclusion, you can come to us and we can configure it. But yeah, that's, that's uh, really difficult. Yeah. That's very good. And there's a, there's a couple of other really great questions that uh, perhaps I, I'd invite Max uh, into the discussion now as well. Um, and, and perhaps uh, this question is uh, geared towards perhaps both, both Martin and Max. Um, when we're looking at uh, short uh, planning horizons, um, how can a short planning horizon be combined with a lot of uh, influence from the workers in their own planning? So, you know, talk a lot, I guess, about work-life balance and things like that as well. You know, what would you two consider to be a good planning horizon for the employee's sake, if I, if I read that question uh, correctly there? Max, you want to go first? I, I'll leave you the first step, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think like um, this this concept, it's, I think like in, uh, in the Netherlands, we call it self-rostering. So that basically means that you give employees the ability to uh, pick their own schedules and you publish the free shifts and they can pick it up the ones they want. And it works for a lot of employees. This is uh, very favorable because they feel in control. But... At the same time, we also see uh, pilots uh, doing that fail because there's also a group in the organization that is actually not as good as picking the right shifts every time again when at the moment they're getting published. They just say like, well, just distribute them equally uh, over everybody. So just give me the ability to uh, uh, list my preferences when I want to work and when not. And then basically look on a more like aggregated skill, take all the preference for everybody into account, and then make some kind of a point system, just with like annual leave planning. Like if you take a holiday off with Eastern and uh, in the summer holiday, then you should not be surprised that you need to work with Christmas, right? But with self-rostering, it's getting more difficult. So I think it's a combination of a very good uh, uh, employee engagement application, like Queenix, where you list all the preferences. And then basically an algorithm should decide like, who's getting uh, what favorable shift, but then you also need to the, define what is favorable, like which shifts are more, uh, are better than other shifts. And I think this is a discussion, uh, again, that uh, needs to be held also with like the um, employee council and organization to really design something that fits the, uh, the planning flow. Yeah, that's a great answer. And Max, any, any commentary from you there in terms of helping with that, that work-life balance that you were talking around? Just, um, I mean, um, Martin said it quite well. So, um, as for widget brain, it's also for us. We are never um, taking any situation the same way. Um, so it's always individual. Depends on the culture of the company, uh, the processes, the employees. Um, so we would first um, talk to anybody who's who, who wants to do this and find the right solution. I think there's no like general answer I could give to this. Um, so um, that depends and happy to talk about this. Great. And another one for, for you, Max, as well. Uh, we're talking about implementation now. So if we are going to, there's a question here around how long it takes to implement Quinix. Uh, any commentary from you in terms of um, implementation of a, of a typical project that we see? Right. Um, um... So um, also depends. Um, first of all, we take uh, our customers from the very beginning to the very end. So it's like uh, doing the driving license with us. Um, we um, manage you through the whole process and won't leave you uh, before everything is in place. Um, just to give you an idea, maybe um, best is always to talk about examples. Um, so it took us uh, four months to implement um, for a larger retailer here in Germany with 1,000 um, employees and 320 shops. Um, so then we can go from that um, point, you know, uh, either to higher uh, or big, bigger scale companies or lower scale companies. So four months is always like the rule of thumb, but it can vary. Um, and we are happy um, to find that out with anybody who wants to be interested. Great. And there's another question here. It's originally asked to, to, to Martin. So I'll ask Martin to respond first, but I think it's a great one for, for all three uh, panelists to, to comment on. Um, the question is, uh, 
that the professional planners like to use AI and, and they really see the opportunities. But how can we as a business persuade management to experiment with the new tech? So predominantly uh, the question asked around the, the AI, but I think it's a really great point for, for all three of you in terms of uh, any encouragement that you can uh, recommend for uh, getting the business to adapt new technology, whether it be um, workforce management tools like mobile, uh, solutions, uh, AI for forecasting, or anything else that, that you see on the on the floor. So, Martin, if you'd like to to start. Yeah, I love to start. But maybe Sarah, this is actually more like an implementation uh, qu question. Yeah, um, and, and this is where we see with the managers what they can do, what they couldn't do in the past is they can actually measure the success on the way you know getting the information in and seeing how they're planning better and reducing costs while increasing efficiency and, um, and usually a lot more employee satisfaction, like I said, and measuring it, that really entices those managers to want to use it and see how they're doing. Because in the past, it's been a bit more difficult. And um, I think it'll, it'll be a game changer now, tools that are coming out like Quinix and, and Widget Brain. I think like for us, like what we normally do is we ask people to basically like give us schedules from the last month and give us your historical uh, forecastable data, your demand data. And then basically we create schedules like this, uh, it would look like if we would do it. And then we compare it to their schedules and they're never perfect, these schedules, but it gives you a very good estimation of like the money you're currently wasting or the amount of compliance violations you have or uh, the the the... Yeah, the, basically the, the reason why you have uh, unsatisfied customers, you know, you can then basically quantify it. And then you basically have a uh, business case between if we would move to a digital organization compared to manual scheduling, these are the costs and these are the benefits and then they need to quantify it. And so far we almost always see a case for uh, planning with AI, but yeah, basically I'm an AI company, so <laughs> I would not say anything else, but yeah, that's our experience. Yeah, um, Martin, real quick on that one too, is, you know, in, in HR, it is really difficult in a lot of cases to get a positive ROI within a short term, you know, for recruitment, for example. Yeah. Um, yes, we do need to implement recruitments to, to attract the best talents. But what we're seeing with the workforce management is that these um, implementations, the ROIs um, are within a year to two years, and especially now where the companies are struggling, these are types of projects that we can get through now because we can convince the CEOs and CFOs, yes, you're investing money, but you're going to get a very quick return on investment because you're gonna add a lot of it, efficiency, transparency, and satisfaction in the companies. And if all of that doesn't work, the proof of the putting is in the eating. So we are also very happy uh, to prove it um, on a small scale, of course, but then you can um, uh, broaden it up um, to the whole organization. I think this is also something you should always encounter. I know that we Germans like to think it through first before we do anything, um, but um, I am very positive that this is going to change and um, more um, daring things are coming up in this way. So uh, POCs are always a, be a good way to, to present to management as well. I also think like it's also not a question if, it's more a question when, right? Like I don't think any organization is really as a roadmap now to continue with manual planning. You know, they need to change. Everybody is clear on that. So yeah, when are you going to do that? That's basically it. That's good. And I think, uh, uh, Max, would you uh, perhaps agree? I think when we're talking about, you know, barriers to entry to experimenting with new technology, sometimes cost might might play a, a part in that for a, for a business. So potentially allowing employees to trial something on their own personal devices uh, could be a way around that. Uh, what do you think? Totally. Um, always a good option. Um, as again, as I said again, you know, um, let's try it and make it work. Um, that should be the outcome of um, everything here. And we've had uh, one more come up uh, for, for Sarah. Um, uh, Michael asks, I, th I think the social partners could have a big part in this. Do you have any examples around that?
You may just still be on mute. Oh, hi, I am on mute. <laughs> uh, sorry, um, I think the social partners could have a big part in this. Um, what are you meaning by the social partners? Give Michael a couple of moments there to respond. Yeah. It's um, uh, labor unions. Ah, yes, they will have a big part of this. Um, an interesting uh, antidote was I was at a customer's and I'm, I'm a big fan of empowering the employees, you know, the self services and let them, if they forgot to clock in, let them change that, let them swap ships amongst themselves because, you know, it, there's, they don't have to call up their line manager and say, I want to, to swap shifts. So a lot of times they call in sick before they'll swap, you know, call up a manager to, to ask to swap a shift. So if we empower them, this will be a lot more, um, a lot better. And, you know, I was trying to, to push that or, you know, place this thought at a company and the, the line manager was saying, oh, no, 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 we can't do this. Well, you know, these poor employees. And the works council was actually at the meeting and he looked at the line manager and says, this is what the employees want. You know, and usually, you know, I do a lot of negotiations with Works Council and they're, you know, they're saying, no, 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 you can't do this. But um, here we're getting it the opposite way around where the Works Councilors are saying, yeah, please empower our employees. It adds to their satisfaction. So that is going to be really exciting to see how that changes. Excellent. And that is all the questions we've we've uh, we've got so far um I'll, I'll just keep speaking for a couple of moments to see if any other filter in um but if not thank you all very much for for joining and of course your your questions that you've thrown to the panelists thank you to to max sarah and and martin for for your insight and and your uh your commentary around uh, today's subjects i think it's been very uh, beneficial so um yeah, looks like no more questions, just a, a, a thanks for the webinar. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the participants for joining. Um, you know uh, where to find us and um, contact information is on screen uh, should you want to reach out to, to any of us as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we will distribute the, the webinar and the slides afterwards as well. Thanks for hosting, Sammy. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.